So we are here for performance metrics, perverse incentives, and a missing panacea, uh, talking about transit operation measurement and resiliency. For those who do not know me, my name is Jeff Kessler. I've introduced myself God knows how many times this morning. Um, I work in operations technology for Helix, which is the commuter rail contract operator uh, in Boston. I have worked for a bunch of different transit systems, having been in Philly, uh, SEPTA, New York City Transit, WMATA in DC, um, Amtrak for a little bit of time. So I spent a lot of time in different transit systems, and I've always sort of been hovering on that line of operations and operations technology and performance metrics. And so what we're going to talk about today is sort of my vision for this was really to make it a discussion talk type of thing. So I don't have a deck prepared because I'm not going to bore you with deck by PowerPoint, especially on a Saturday morning. Instead, I just want to talk about some of the considerations of various different metrics that we have, as well as also talk about uh, just some of the other factors at play when we have these metrics and we're trying to implement these metrics in our transit systems and then really just sort of open it up to an open dialogue discussion about some of the values and things that we're talking about. If anyone has any questions throughout, feel free to just sort of unmute yourself, give a little wave, um, or just type a message in the chat. We are not in the Q&A mode, so anyone can just unmute themselves and ask a question. So the first thing, of course, that I want to talk about are the performance metrics that are typically used by a trans. The other thing, by the way, is I walk and talk a lot, and I haven't had the opportunity to walk and talk in six or seven weeks now because of quarantine. So you're going to see me walk and talk to the extent that I can, just because this is I can actually move. This is exciting. Um, but yeah, so of course the biggest metric that we all hear about all the time is something called OTP, which typically stands for on-time performance. And it's the common metric used by various transit agencies to report the performance of a transit line, system, trip, etc. And normally it just consists of the metric, did a train or bus or line or whatever, what is the average on-time performance? Within that, it's typically just measured as the arrival time of the trip at the terminus, the last stop on the trip or the line. We then also have headway-based metrics, which is dubbed a couple of different things. The MTA in New York uses something known as weight assessment, which essentially looks at the headway or the frequency between trains and says how far of a deviation from the scheduled headway are we seeing. So in other words, if you expect to wait five minutes, is that metric within five or six minutes okay? That's fine. If it's double that of 2x, then it's really bad if it's more than a 10-minute wait. If it's seven and a half minutes or less, that's considered within the realm of acceptable. But essentially, this is sort of a metric that determines your spacing in various different transit lines. Uh, there's then also journey time metrics, which are a really great way of measuring how individuals in a various, in a particular transit system, how on time their particular trips are. So really the biggest case where we see this is something like WMATA in DC, which is where they're actually tracking from the smart trip cards of passengers who tap in and tap out of the system to see how on time those trips are. And the way that they're basing that is seeing when you tap on and tap out, they're factoring in like a minute to get down to the platform from the time you enter, your, enter the system, a weight on the platform of the maximum scheduled headway at that time, a trip of the scheduled journey time at that time of day, and then a trip, or rather a one minute transfer time if applicable. Again, another headway weight for the next interval on the next connection line if applicable, a scheduled travel time, and then from there a minute to exit the system. Obviously, that requires a lot more data because instead of now being able to compute it on an individual trip basis, you're now able to have the US to compute it on an individual passenger basis. It also requires you, in that case, to not just have the data of all of your passengers, but it sort of biases the data a little bit 
because it's only computing the metric weighted off of your actual passengers, which is good in a way because it's showing you what your passengers experience, but there's a lot of other downsides to that sort of metric because it doesn't really look at the potential for riders who may choose not to take the system because of various factors of travel time and the like that may dissuade them from traveling. Sort of filters that out to an extent. Uh, some of the considerations. So obviously those are sort of the metrics that are commonly used. But the problem is we focus a lot often on OTP. But often OTP doesn't tell us everything. And the biggest reason for that is resiliency and response. So what I mean by that is if we look at OTP, OTP has a lot of challenges with it and a lot of problems. So first of all, say that we have a train that goes from stop A to B, C, D, E, F, and G. So this trip from A to G is going to make all of these stops and get to the end. We're only tracking the performance of that trip. On yeah. The arrival. yeah. Let's, di let's distinguish between the different types of OTP here. We, you and I may think of it as terminal OTP. For example, for buses, it's typically pull-out OTP. That's fair. That's another thing. So yeah, so there's all sorts of metrics that can even use the same terminology. So as Sunny brings up the point, that's another good thing. Pull-out OTP really looks at just give the bus to part the origin on time, which is really just a consideration of did we get the bus out and ready to go, but not really looking at is it encountering any traffic along the way. Just really did we send it out from the origin at its scheduled departure time. Which granted, traffic will impact that metric if you have cases where the vehicle gets delayed in traffic and then it makes and then it's late to depart its next individual trip. On a rail-based side where you or even in some sort of BRT systems I've seen, you typically do terminal OTP, which is what I was getting out of. If you have stop A to stop G, really all you're doing is measuring the on-time performance of that trip at stop G, which means we have the sort of, uh, I don't want to say bad practice because it's the time-honored tradition within the industry, of making your schedule such that it is following an unrealistic schedule up until the second to last stop and then having an insane amount of travel time from your second to last stop to your last stop to sort of gain the system, if you will. Because now you've suddenly taken a trip that could take, you know, I, New Jersey Transit is a big, great example of someone who does this all the time. If you have an inbound train from Trenton to New York, the travel time from Trenton to Hamilton Station is typically about five minutes. The reverse going from Hamilton to Trenton is regularly in excess of 10 minutes per the schedule, which realistically, there, there are some considerations there as to why it could be delayed arriving as opposed to departing where it's typically waiting. But by and large, you're not going to encounter five minutes solely attributable to that fact. What it does is it buys them an extra five minutes on top of the schedule to get to the last station. And this is common at, and standard practice at every railroad which the other thing is, again, trying to compare across railroads, you have a lot of different metrics in terms of just even how you define the on-time performance threshold. So the example there being, you know, most railroads in the United States use 5 minutes and 59 seconds as a train being on time. So if a train arrives in six, basically 6 minutes or less, it's on time. The commuter rail up here in Boston, we use 4 minutes and 59 seconds. SEPTA used to use 4 minutes and 59 seconds on regional rail until they switched it to go to 5.59 to sort of use that more industry standard. And needless to say, their on-time performance metrics went up because now there's an extra minute of buffer that you have at each of these locations. The problem with OTP, of course, as we've been talking about, is most riders are not going end-to-end -end on the system. So while it's a great sort of example for having someone going from the beginning of one line to the end, it has absolutely nothing to do with intermediate travel times and sort of the standard arrival times at the midpoints. So one of the other types of OTP that you regularly have is something known as sort of stop-specific or time-point OTP. 
With time point OTP, this allows you to measure your on-time performance at each of a designated number of time points on a particular line. But again, here, now it increases the computation significantly because you have to compute your on-time performance metrics at each of these individual locations per trip as opposed to a single trip being a, having one sort of Boolean value for was it on time or not. So now that we're factoring in all of these individual points, you also have to consider how you're going to measure it. Because typically we have easy ways to track on time performance arrivals at terminals, but at the <coughs> most point, you often don't have things like individual track circuits for a single location to be able to determine <coughs> if that is the, um, the particular location and the arrival on time performance there. If you want to do it at every stop, now you have to have a robust ADL system that's able to keep track of your actual movements and get your precise arrival time at each station to be able to do it. And even then, when you're averaging it, that's getting you a good metric for how much you are adhering to the schedule. What it's not telling you is anything about the spacing of your trips. So what I mean by this is the headway adherence sort of case. So in this case, putting aside OTP and going to a headway weight assessment metric, in the headway case, we're typically having a measurement to say, are trains running every six minutes as scheduled? And say there's a big delay and now all of a sudden people are going ahead and now it's 12 minutes, well that's a significant gap. So we're measuring the gaps in service. But if we're using an OTP metric, we get penalized for sort of evening out the gaps. Because if we try to even out the gaps, which is a good thing to do from a customer service and operations perspective, all that does is say, well, guess what? You evened out your gap, but now you've made every train late by X number of minutes by shifting them off from their regular dispatch interval. Conversely, though, if we just look at a headway-based system, we're doing absolutely nothing to look at the actual travel time. So the problem with travel time, when we're looking at travel time, is a headway based system, if every train is leaving consistently every six minutes, but each trip is taking an extra 10 minutes each, now what we're doing is we're saying, okay, each of these trips is taking an extra 10 minutes. That's not being tracked anywhere in our metrics. And again, there's all the special cases of the way to be resilient in any good rail operation is looking at things like conducting a detour, doing express operations, short turns to get service back on track. The problem is when we do that, our metrics are not geared to being able to withstand sort of these resiliency operations. And quite frankly, what you see in a lot of cases is putting it where the end result, or rather not the end result, the end user is being forced to decide, do I ruin my metrics or do I do what's better for the operation and the customer? And you see that all the time in contracted operations. There's a lot of contracts out there that say, if you have a particular train going, you know, at a certain place, and it's not just even performance, if you have, say, a 10-car train and it's short one seat, you get penalized the same amount as if you ran that train with only a single seat on it. So again, it's really a factor of we're having our boards demand these numbers that really are valuable and do give us insight. But the problem is no matter what metric you choose, you're getting sort of only one side of the point. And I think, you know, one of the big topics that's sort of a managerial accounting principle is the concept of a balanced scorecard, which is being able to determine not just a menu of one metric, but sort of an assembly of different metrics that can be used to determine and analyze a particular transit mode from these various perspectives and sort of eliminate the problems encountered by one versus another. So for example, if we use OTP and headway together, that's a good way to sort of balance the spacing issues as well as the scheduled travel time issues. But we need a way that we can incorporate those as well as all of the factors that we discussed with things like being able to measure intermediate time points being able to measure factors such as, you know, if we're doing any bit of actual passenger counts, then we're either doing origin destination prediction models. We need fare card data for that. We need a lot of data and there's privacy risks associated with that that are way more advanced than if we were to just simply have a single sort of metric. So I think realistically, 
I wanted to do sort of this brief introduction, and I hope that gives you a basic sort of consideration and framework to consider some of the challenges that we have in the context of on-time performance metrics and performance metrics in general. But really, I want to have this be, you know, the latter half of this, really be an open dialogue and discussion of what are the good ways that we're doing performance metrics, what are agencies and some of you folks out there doing well that you think works really nicely, what isn't working for you, and what are the ways that you think we can sort of have better metrics that look at all of these different aspects of transit operations. I see there's a gentleman who unmuted in a blue shirt. If you want to go ahead. Sandy? Uh, question for you. Are you aware of any systems that run hybrid, headway, and timetable-based uh, services? Where, whereas, you know, when, um, like, a, a certain segment of the system is run on a headway basis, um, and other segments are not? I think, and I might ask, I know there are a couple of people on here who uh, are currently in New York City Transit. I used to work in New York City Transit for a bit. There are a combination of things like weight assessment, and I believe there is also a terminal assessment. I think WMATA has done, WMATA in D.C. only has had sort of a headway-based metric, but they have also transitioned a bit more to doing some on-time performance for the uh, for the rail system, especially when they start running a 26-minute headway for track work and things of that nature where every minute counts and people really are basing their lives around the schedule. So I, those are the ones that I can think of immediately off the top of my head. I'm curious, uh, anyone else on the call, does your agency do both? Do you know of any others that do So both? the way I understood um, the question was that He's looking for routes that are um, timetable or headway, timetable versus headway based from the start rather than from a measurement perspective. I no, what I'm asking is, are there systems that run certain portions of their network on a headway based, you know, on a headway basis, and other segments of it on on timetable basis? Basis. When you when you're saying run on a headway basis, are you saying um, that it's actually like, is it, I don't know. when you say it's run on a headway basis, are you saying that it's measured primarily from a metric perspective as a headway basis, or is it actually managed no, as a headway basis operationally? The, the, the latter. Okay. So New York City Transit it, really isn't a, it's sort of a, it's a, New York City Transit really is a hybrid case in that both metrics are reported to the public. Um, both metrics are measured, but and and from a service management perspective, it's really a hybrid of of the two. It's you you have to try to manage to a headway, but at the same time, um, you're considering individual trips because you know that if you do something, it's going to come back and haunt you on the other direction. Right, right, and there's a customer service aspect to that as well. Yeah, I think uh, pretty much every, most agencies, certainly a lot of smaller ones, especially college towns, they certainly operationally will have headway and, uh, again, schedule-based service. And that, that becomes a challenge in terms of the technology. And then I think, yeah, as Sunny said, reporting side, yeah, both are reported. But I think certainly smaller agencies try to avoid headway-based reporting because it's just tougher from the... Uh, operational technology perspective. So I, f I find this topic really interesting. Uh, so I work with a uh, scheduling consulting firm, and we work with public transit agencies around North America and in some ways around the world, uh, helping them optimize their schedules. Uh, I used to work at Chicago Transit Authority as manager of bus scheduling years ago. Uh, where we went through this huge process of trying to improve reliability of the system, and a lot of it meant rescheduling the routes, but also analyzing how they operate, using a lot of the data from AVL systems to see, okay, how does this route actually run on a daily basis, putting up string charts, 
showing how the routes performed, where the but where the bunches occurred, where the gaps occurred. And one of the things that we try to do nowadays is work with agencies to 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 redefine how they actually measure their performance because some of the agencies I work with um, and also I'm getting feedback so if somebody can use their microphone. I think we're getting an echo from it. Yeah. Um, but uh, so talk about OTP metrics. There are several agencies that I work with that their bus OTP metric is basically all time points within you know one minute early to five minutes later, whatever their particular range is, and they say, well, we want to be 80% on time. And of course, that makes no sense because what does that actually mean? First of all, you have all these different time points. Okay, so your AVL system can measure what time it got to wherever, but what does that really, how does that benefit? And then you wind up with the schedules that get really fat because buses have to kill a lot of time mid-route just to be on time. Um, when, when I was at CTA, one of the things that we really focused on was basically keep the bus on time at the initial terminal, which is a scheduling function. So, well, it's, it's two things. It's a scheduling function and an operations function. Make sure the bus has enough time to depart on time and make sure that the drivers are properly, I guess you could say incentivized, uh, whatever, what, whichever way you want to do that, to not leave late. Because that's a big problem as well, as drivers that don't take the schedule seriously will cause the operation to fall apart. And then from there, you give them a bit of leeway, you know, not, not too much, but like a little bit of leeway to just, you know, drive normally so that passengers aren't sitting on buses waiting around for, you know, four or five minutes, you know, wasting time but also not to the point where drivers feel like they need to have a, a lead foot just to keep on time. And then make sure that you're at the end of the route, you put enough recovery time in there so that they can leave their next trip again on time. Um, and then you also want to measure the things like what we would call big gaps. How, how much of a route has more than, let's say, uh, whatever percentage higher than its scheduled headway? So therefore, you know, it, it's one thing for an individual bus or a set of buses to be on time, but uh, as you said, it's also, well, okay, if this bus was on time but everybody else around it was 15 minutes late or something, then, you know, you wind up with these huge gaps in service headway-wise. So um, a lot of agencies have the data capabilities now because they've got AVL systems, what they don't have are people who really know how to use that information in a meaningful manner. And they, they default to uh, the vendor's reporting software for AVL, which generally is pretty crap. Apologies to anyone who works for an AVL vendor here, but their software typically sucks at uh, producing you know reports because it's not really analytical. It's just, oh, yeah, 80% on time, there you go. Well, what does that mean? You know, was it on time for the first time, four time points and then late on the last one? Were four trips on time perfectly and one trip was way late? You know, all these different nuances that you completely miss with a lot of the, the default reporting software out there. There's two interesting comments in the chat right now. One is about just even the binary nature of OTP metrics. This is something that you hit on a little bit as well but a lot of agencies have the data and do report internally sort of in buckets of what percentage are within, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, five minutes, et cetera, for this on-time performance threshold, and they have the data to calculate it on a variable basis, but a lot of times we just see that there is those for internal purposes, and then there's the official on-time performance metric, which has that sort of standardized threshold. Um, and the other comment that uh, gentleman or Deep made was about third-party apps and tools. You know, again, same thing you were saying. A lot of the modern AVL systems have the capability for it and collect the data for it. They just don't aggregate it themselves, nor do they really have a good interface for, well, you can tell that uh, you and I both have worked in AVL systems. They don't really have uh, anything that's 
next software, but in particular reporting stuff falls short in a lot of ways. So what, like one other thing that I'm just thinking of right now as we're sort of going through this is also even the discussion of when, you know, because we talk about these hard binary stops, one thing that's also not even really defined is when do we care more about a headway basis versus a schedule basis. I think for me, my general rule of thumb is about a 12-minute headway is when I care about the schedule. Less than that, I'm more okay with having a, you know, headway-based dispatch because at worst, any sort of deviation, the biggest deviation you can get from that is really going to just wind up leading to a delay of about, I guess, six minutes, which incidentally happens to be sort of the standard threshold for on-time performance. That I think once you get to a 12 plus is when it really gets to be people start looking at schedules. That's actually pretty consistent with the research, um, which is that people generally treat a, a service of up to 11 minutes as totally turn up and go, and then when you get to about 27 minutes, it's totally timetable based, and everything in between is just a, a range. That is the, um, for, for New York City Transit, where we have to assign bus passengers waiting times, we followed that model. Fred has a good point of thinking about this from sort of a project management perspective of just having, you know, early starts, late starts, perfect starts, and finishes, um, and talking about intermediate transition points being important. So I guess, you know, here's another question. Is it worth, and this is a values judgment now, is it worth measuring on-time performance treating every stop equally? Should they be weighted by a passenger boards and exits by stop? Should we only consider the certain stops that are important milestones? You know, and the other thing that we talked about briefly in terms of early versus late, in early bus and early train, etc., for the person who is wanting a precision scheduled trip, for them, that trip being one minute early is the equivalent of the entire headway plus that minute plus the delay of the next trip as the delay that they will personally experience. Right. So then the question becomes, you know, to what extent are you, do you want to minimize early departures and how can you remain dynamic if you're measuring that on a stop-by-stop -stop basis? Well, well Jeff, Jeff here, here's something that I think needs to be taken into the equation. Most commuters will travel what I consider twice their hourly salary. Okay, and, and most commuters, be it on a bus, ha are of a lower income. So their specific minutes become more important. So like if you're traveling across the city, maybe you give yourself 30 minutes to take the bus. Typically with that, you'll give yourself a 30% buffer of 10 minutes. And it's all about that consistency because if they're not making it on time, they don't make it to where they where they need to be, i.e. work or an appointment. So then how is a transit agency or a transit operator or anyone trying to analyze the performance able to elicit that value of a 30% buffer and be able to use that on an individual basis and sort of view it and aggregate it up for everyone? It, so it, go, go ahead. Well, there's, uh, there's three levels to that. There's individual individual segments. There's overall travel travel time, and then there's also the period. Um, uh, uh, I shoot. I went blank. I'm sorry. But the two are individual and overall travel time are the two important pieces because most people taking public transportation are looking for consistency. So the, the caveat with that is that if you're trying to achieve that consistency for every trip and your service is inherently variable, whether that be buses with traffic or trains with track work, you're going to end up putting so much time in the schedule that you're going to get consistent weights. 
yes, the operation will be smooth. You're going to have consistency. People will know what time they're getting there. But you're going to end up slowing the service to a point where you start losing riders. Well, I, I think with technology today, you the, the next um, quantum leap is going to be um, – as the day progresses, and, and it's been done in the past, during rush hour, there's been a slightly different schedule than during non-peak times. I think as we move forward with technology, those things are actually fairly consistent when you look over um, traffic times within a urban area. One, so a couple of things from the comments. First of all, if you're speaking, can you make sure your camera's on? Uh, makes it, you know, as I used to say, uh, perfectly, makes it feel more interactive. Um, I'm sorry. Sonny and Fred, your cameras are off. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think these are all really valuable points. Jay in the comments said about how, you know, uh, about accessibility needs. That is a good point. There is no accessibility sort of understanding in any OTP metrics. So being able to do accessibility improvements that improve your on-time performance is a way that you can to sort of incentivize this accessibility improvements. The problem is, though, I mean, I hate to say this and I hate to sound blunt because this is just a practice I've seen, you know, pervasive throughout the industry, is if you have a delay, a disabled passenger is your greatest thing because now you as an operator can suddenly explain away your entire delay and charge the delay to, you know, any sort of, dis any sort of you know, passenger with a disability. So I think, yes, there's an incentive, but operators don't necessarily want to get rid of that because it's sort of their excuse to say our numbers are lower and would be artificially our numbers will be higher because they're artificially deflated due to us taking care of this critical population. Um, but Daniel made a uh, wonderful comment that I just want to read here. Uh, you know, so many problems with performance metrics or management and boards don't want to see scores below 90 or for sure 80 on a 100 point scale, even if it means using a lower threshold than what the public implicitly use. You know, I'd much rather agencies sometimes have bad scores that accurately reflect reality. I think that's, you know, a big part of this discussion is how can we, you know, and I hate to say it, even if you change the weights of those metrics, how can you make a metric that can be sort of on that 100-point scale so that even if we internally would consider it, you know, 50 to 100% is within an acceptable range or even, you know, zero or five percent is an acceptable value, how can we normalize those figures to meet this sort of, I don't want to say myopic, but this standardized formulaic approach to a board reviewing a transit system and analyzing its performance? So, Joe, so I think when it, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, ultimately what it comes down to is you know, if you're going to set goals, you have to set goals within what you're able to control. And so, like, buses leaving the garage on time is a an agency-controlled metric, you know. That's a, a maintenance and an operations thing. So you ha should have some kind of goal for that and, you know, make sure that all your runs are filled and, you know, that they, that they leave on time. Um, leaving the initial terminals on time is an operations and a scheduling controllable goal, meaning that generally speaking, you know, if the driver is on that bus at the terminal ready to go and the schedule provided enough time for them to get to that terminal uh, before they need to leave. But then stuff in the middle like, okay, were we at the seventh time point on a 25-mile route on within a six-minute window when your variability can be 25 minutes? That's not something you can really control. That shouldn't really be a specific goal, at least in terms of, well, we want to be there 80% of the time. It's like, it's out of your control. Don't hold yourself to it. Just hold yourself to the stuff that you can control. I sort of disagree, to be quite honest, just because in my mind, I've seen metrics that sort of look both ways. One is sort of the controllable, the controllable case, and the other is the uncontrollable case. So if you look, a lot of railroads have 
sort of two internal on-time performance metrics. One is a total on-time performance metric, and another is an adjusted OTP metric, which is we explain away all of the delays associated with weather and, uh, you know, passengers boarding and any sort of freight train conflicts. Those get explained away, and then you increase your OTP level to an adjusted OTP metric. So I think it's not necessarily bad. I don't think we want to get into the rat's nest that is delay attribution. Well, right, but it's, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I think you do want metrics on both because, one, you want that internal scorecard to say, are you dispatching appropriately? But I also think it's valuable to have a metric that says, you know, how, what is the customer experiencing on this trip relative to what we publish as a schedule? And because even if there is a schedule schedule, you need to have a way to, a way to analyze and internalize that to be able to say, we need to change our schedule to account for these vari this variability. Yeah, and I think, so there is actually a lot of research uh, into, again, the customer focus metrics. I mean, I totally agree with you, Jeff, that I think both of those are needed, the operationally focused ones and the ones that are more focused on the exterior that the customer faces. So, uh, and I'm most familiar with this, but I'm sure there are other resources. The MIT Transit Lab has been doing a lot of research with uh, the London Underground, with WMATA, with New York City. It, the agencies they've worked with has varied over time. So I'll send over a link, but there are a number of theses on this topic on performance measurement, which talks about travel time reliability, talks about excess journey time. Uh, I think the challenge has been a lot of that research happened late part of 2000s, early part of 2010s. It's how to bring that into uh, actual use within an agency. Because as, we, as, we, as we've touched upon, there are a lot of issues with, uh, again, using data, but not just using data, but having a lot of people understand how that data is used, what does the metric represent? And so I think that that's a good area for the research because my sense is a lot of the research that was done was made sense for an agency like TFL may not be as easy to bring into the culture at other agencies or may take a little while. I'll send over the link in the chat for people who want to find out more. So yeah, in the chat, we were just having a little thing of, you know, uh, who was it? I think it was Daniel who uh, made a good comment about, um, about, you know, having the ability to sort of have metrics with both. Uh, someone earlier I saw asked a question about being able to include TSP in OTP metrics. And I think it's sort of, from what I've seen, and again, I really, to be quite honest, have been more on the rail side since a lot of TSP projects have come into, you know, have seen the light of day. Uh, I think it's that you use, the, I'm going to sound very skeptical and you know, a bit of a heretic when I say it, but if people use the data to say TSP works no matter what, but nonetheless, I do think it often has valuable improvements, so don't get me wrong, I'm not a skeptic on uh, TSP in general, but I just think, you know, no matter what, if someone does a TSP project, they will report that it improved on-time performance for that line using whatever sort of analysis they need to do. But that's not limited to transit, that's data anywhere is people will fit the data to meet their narrative. So I just realized we have fewer than five minutes left in this discussion. Uh, so if there's anything that we have not touched on that people want to talk about, feel free. TSP stands for Transit Signal Prioritization. Um, I believe that's the official. It's basically when you have a, a bus or a light rail train operating in mixed traffic that's able to prioritize the travel of, you know, the example I always think of is like how some ambulances can send out a signal so they get green lights, same sort of thing for buses in general. 
I had a question earlier that I put on the chat that I'm wondering, does anybody measure OTP for linked trips within the same network? The reason I ask is that we're looking at, at BART, we're looking at going to a much uh, denser service than we provide today, two minutes headways through the Transbay tube, and we want to incentivize people transferring versus assuming that everybody wants a single seat ride. The only case that I know of, and if others know of others, definitely bring them up, is WMATA in D.C., which, much like BART in a lot of cases, has a tap-in, tap-out system. So the way that they instituted it was after, I'm sure you're probably familiar with WMATA's whole state track, state of good repair initiative. So a couple of years back, they did a massive rebuilding campaign to rebuild the track and sort of win riders back. And one of the problems they were facing, which is something that we talked about in the chat a little bit, is the stigma of transit is never on time. And so what they did to combat it was automatic refunds if your train was more than a given amount of time late. And so what they did was they looked at from your entry time in the system. So say that you're traveling from uh, National Airport to uh, Silver Spring, as an example. So when I tap in at National, Air National Airport, I would be expecting to take a, the longest possible journey I could probably take would be a blue line train from National Airport up to Metro Center, transfer at Metro Center from the blue line to the red line and then go to Silver Spring. And so they give a minute from the time you tap your card to get to the platform, the max headway for the blue line at that hour, then your arrival at the transfer station, a minute for the transfer time, and then the max headway for the red line, which is your next line at that hour of day. Then travel time from uh, Metro Center to Silver Spring, and then a minute to exit the system. So they're not doing any sort of real-time metric of, you know, what train you're on and if it's held for a connection, but if trains are holding for a connection, which I know BART does a lot, that would be reflected in the fact that you're seeing sort of less than the scheduled headway in terms of these trips. And Kurt, I see, put the link to how WMATA does their rush hour promise in the chat. So if you take a look in the chat right now, there's the link to that. Does anyone know of any others? So yeah, trying to search for it. I, I do remember this, again, total journey time metric that, again, TFL MIT was working on. Uh, it's in one of those theses, the link that I sent a little bit earlier. There is research there, but it is challenging because it combines, again, AFC, AVL, uh, sometimes APC data. And the issue often is there's lots of mismatches between data. There's the historically AFC data also usually came in a day or two later, but it's, it can be done. And I'm sure you'll find out more in one of those theses. I can send the link once I look into it. Speaking from the New York City Transit side of, of, of subway trips, um, even if you're using a representative day as opposed to daily AFC data like, like some agencies do, and we actually recommend that because if you use a, rep, if you use a single day's trips, you don't have variation in performance that comes simply from varying the trips. Um, the problem with linked trips, with doing the metric based on linked trips, is that there is increasing demand for um, very short turnarounds on reporting time. And once you start link linking trips, you basically have to match schedule to the actual iteratively until you've completed the trip that has the most transfers. And in New York City, that can be many, many transfers, not just one or two. Uh, and that made the processing time unbearably long to the point where we couldn't satisfy the operations demands of, okay, I want my performance metrics by noon the next day, which we couldn't do. So I know this flew by, but we are actually out of time. Uh, so thanks again for everyone. I hope this was an enjoyable discussion for all of you. I certainly enjoyed a lot of it. 